All right. One of my favorites. So hopefully you guys had a wonderful Thanksgiving with family and friends. Hopefully your prayer time was pulled off a little more successfully than my buddy Greg there. Um, you know, I always find Thanksgiving and Christmas interesting, right? Especially the prayer time. Because there's always, there's like this jockeying for who's going to have to give the prayer or not give the prayer. Anybody have that in their families where there's like the uncomfortable, awkward, where everybody's looking around? Yeah, Hope, Hope does. She's my daughter, so that makes sense. But <laughs> it's interesting to me because it's all very confusing, right? Like you don't know who is supposed to pray. Is it the person with the most ministry experience? Is it the lead male of the home who is hosting? Is it the person who simply thinks they're the most religious? It's all this like weird thing with everybody looking around and trying to figure it out. And then the second thing you're trying to figure out <clears throat> during that moment is, is do they really want to be praying at all? Right? Because it's just like, you know, everybody's looking at you. You got the judgy eyes. You got the cousin in the background who... <clears throat> doesn't really like anyone and doesn't want to be there anyway. And then the, the thing that's even more interesting is once the prayer starts. How many of you guys are, are uh, open-eyed prayers? I am. Sometimes you wish you weren't, right? You'd rather be the closed-eye prayer, especially in those moments, because then I'm just always sitting there like looking around, like <laughs> taking in like, hey, how's this going for everybody? And, and so when you're doing that, it's always funny, I always kind of, like when the prayer begins, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, is this person Baptist? Was this person Baptist? Do you guys know how to know? Right? So if it's under a minute, they were never a Baptist. Right? <laughs> under a minute, never Baptist. If it's between one minute and two minutes, maybe they were a Baptist at some point in their life. And then if it's over three minutes, they're definitely still Baptist. Right? And so... <laughs> So about half of the prayers that we have in our family are from current Baptist. And then at about the two and a half minute mark, everybody starts like looking up and looking around except the Baptist. And it's, it's always fun. And then the final role of, of, the, of the family prayer time is, is there a football game being played and on the television while the prayer is going on? Because then you have like half the dudes... Like one eye open, one eye closed, trying to check out the football game. But then the, the absolute funniest part, and I, please tell me that you guys, have, this has happened to you. It's happened to me, and I've actually done this. But you get all the way through the prayer, and then realize after it's over, you never bless the food. <laughs> that one happened to anybody this year? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it happened at ours. And he's not here, so I can say that. Okay, good. All right, so, but here's the thing. I say all that to bring up the point that it's amazing to me the conversations that we have with God, right? And prayer is a conversation. The time that we take to enter into Thanksgiving, to have gratitude, to pray, should be a time of gratitude to God. But very often, even in those times where we're together for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, for times where we're really celebrating what God has done, that element of gratitude is somehow left out, right? And it's amazing that that should be the one thing when we talk to the Father that we're interacting with Him and we're thanking Him for what He has done. Now, as Americans, I think it's very very common for us to get caught up in the culture and the things that the culture has to offer us. And materialism in society can often infect us. And it can begin to minimize and really trivialize the goodness of God that is all around us. And it's amazing that after a day of national thanksgiving is also literally the day of the biggest amount of materialism and greed ever known to humankind. Black Friday. Right? And how often do we like, it's, you're literally like halfway through the turkey, you're, 
you know, getting your seconds and mashed potato and you're eating, and then what's happening at the table all around you? All the phones are up, they're scrolling, and we're all trying to figure out what's the best Black Friday deal, yeah. right? Amazing, like you're there to give thanks, and at the same time, I thank you for, oh, Amazon has 10% less. This is going to be a great Christmas. Now, I will say this. I'm not here to rain on your parade. I'm not even here to make you sad about your great purchases that you got over the last couple days. I think it's awesome that you love your kids and you love your family and you're getting them great things. Um, and I'm also happy that you found them the perfect present. Unlike Pastor John, I'm also happy you found the greatest deal out there. So you had to listen to his message last week where he was on us for trying to find the best deals out there and make us feel bad. But no, it's, it's interesting that it's in the moments of Thanksgiving, in those greatest moments that where we're still looking for other things to satisfy and other things that we want. Now, this morning I want to take a few minutes to kind of bust up our little bubble and then we're going to take a look at the word and see what God has to say about gratitude. So, first of all, did you know researchers have found that materialists are less happy in part because they find it harder to be grateful for what they have? That individuals high in narcissism may not even notice that a gift has occurred because they believe that they are entitled to the benefit. Personality factors can act as barriers to gratitude, in particular envy, materialism, narcissism, and cynicism can be thought of as thieves of thankfulness. And finally, that envy and materialism both involve dwelling on what we do not have. So it should come as no surprise that these emotions may be antithetical to gratitude. Indeed, it may be difficult or even impossible for people to be grateful and envious or materialistic at the same time. Pretty incredible, right? Now, did you also know the Bible already told this to us a really, really long time ago, right? I mean, when you look through the Psalms and the Proverbs, it says a great deal about the condition of our heart and about gratitude and where, where we should be looking for that and what we should be looking to. So, let's go ahead, let's jump into the Bible. If you have it with you, feel free to open to Luke 17, verses 11 through 19. Uh, but we're also going to read it, we'll have it on the screen. So, it starts in, uh, in verse 11. Jesus is hanging out with his disciples. They're going on another one of his famous walks. And on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked, Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? And then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Incredible passage here. Incredible little story. We see in verse 12, as Jesus enters this village, he meets the ten men who are the lepers. And the men were at a distance. Now we know why they were at a distance. In that particular society and in that culture, there was, if you had leprosy, you were simply separated from your community. You were a pariah, you were diseased, so you were set apart not only for social reasons and medical reasons, but also for religious reasons. Because if you were unclean, you could make other people unclean. And so that would affect them spiritually as well as it would obviously affect them physically. And so because of that, it was always the priests rather than medical doctors 
who would confirm that somebody had leprosy and then send them away outside of the community. And so we see that in Leviticus. We see that that was one of the things that priests were to do, that if somebody did have a disease like that, that they were to be set outside of the community. And so that's what had happened to these men who were out there. And so you can imagine when Jesus begins to walk by with his group of disciples, and they've heard the stories. I mean, just because they're social outcasts and they're no longer invited into the inner community, they still know what's going on. They know who this Jesus is. They know the things he has done. And they know that he has healed people. And so as they see Jesus going by, they begin to yell and they begin to call out, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on us. And you can imagine if you're in that position and you're in that situation and you had been outcast and you had had to leave your family, you had had to leave life as you know it, and you were cast out from the community that you had grown up with, the desperation that you would have. And so these men are yelling, God, please, well, Jesus, come and do something. Come and heal us. And so when Jesus saw them, he looked over at them and he said, go show yourselves to the priest. In other words, Jesus was saying, that the priests were the ones who had sent you out because you had an obvious disease on your hands and arms and on your body. So now go show yourself to the priest to show that you have been healed so that you can be allowed to come back in to the community. And so the men knew in this moment, man, this means we're going to be healed. He's telling us to go to the priest. And the last time that I went to a priest was the time I was exiled from my community. But him telling me to go back to the priest is evidence that I'm going to be healed and I'm going to come back into the thing which I had lost. And so these men hearing Jesus tell them to go to the priest knew exactly what he meant, that they were going to be healed. And so they began on their journey to see the priest and then... Verse 14 tells us that as they were going, all of a sudden, they began to be healed. As they went, they were cleansed. Now, I love the imagery of this story, right? Imagine with me how on every single step that these men take, that there was some sort of regenerative power coming through their body, that their fingers, when they were mangled and had sores they would begin to be healed and their arms would begin to be healed and they looked down and they saw their feet and their legs and the skin there begin to be healed can you imagine like with every step that they take they're like I can't believe this is happening I can't believe that this is real and it really to me it's an inspiring view for us is what faith does in the life of a believer, right? For them, it was very instantaneous that their faith, that their believing, that as they stepped to go see the priest, that they could see things begin to change in their life. But how much more even for us, that as we step into faith, as we profess our allegiance to Jesus, the one and only King, that as we walk in faith, as we begin to trust his word, as we begin to read his word and know his word, and it begins to renew our minds, that every step we take in life, change begins to happen. And that we're no longer the people that we used to be. It's an amazing and miraculous process that really is no different than what these men were undergoing just in an instant. It's an incredible picture. But imagine how on that road, as these ten men are walking, the lepers look at each other and they're like, man, I can't believe what is happening. I mean, I, I, I have a weird imagination sometimes, but I'm kind of like, like, I wonder if like dudes were like, you know, taking three steps and they were like, what? This is crazy. And then they would like take five steps back. <laughs> be like oh dude no 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 and then they'd run 10 steps forward like I don't know like I mean if he can heal someone with leprosy it seems like he could do it in a weird way like that too but it just I just like get these pictures like what was this like for these guys and how amazing was it that all 10 of them as they're on this journey begin to be healed but for some reason 
And we don't know why. There was one leper who in the midst of this process of ten guys going to see the priest begins to look at what's happening, begins to see the reality that he is healed. And his heart, that something inside of him is just like, I can't believe this Jesus. I can't believe what this Jesus just did for me. And you wonder if he stopped and he was like, guys, guys, do you see what's happening? And they're all like, yeah, we see what's happening. Let's get to the priest. He's like, no, do you see what's happening? Like, shouldn't we go back and say thank you? Shouldn't we go back and give worship to this one who just set us free? And they're like, dude, listen, do what you want, but we got to get to the priest. He said, go to the priest. We're going to the priest. And and you imagine this one leper just being like, well, yeah, I mean, we got all day to get there, but this guy just healed us. Like, shouldn't we go say thank you? And so we don't know what the conversations are like. We know they definitely had some. But you wonder if the first leper said, guys, aren't you grateful? Aren't you grateful what is, for what has happened? Now here's the thing we know about the nine, other nine lepers. I guarantee you they were grateful. They were grateful. There's no way they weren't. But there's a difference. There's something altogether different between showing gratefulness, showing gratitude, or thinking about it versus doing it. Now I'm going to take a quick little pause and change direction here. But if I were to ask you this morning, what is your most awful sin? What is the worst thing that you've done? Please don't share it out loud. <laughs> but if I were to ask you, I think everybody in here has something kind of in their mind. But how many of us came up with the failure to be grateful to God? The failure to be grateful to God. You know, it was interesting. It kind of hit me this morning. We have prayer before church, and as we were praying, um, Al, I'm not sure where Al is now. Hopefully, oh, there he is. I was just like, hopefully he was okay because he was out shoveling snow. (laughs) But as we were praying this morning, Al began to pray, and he was like, God, I just, I thank you so much for the beauty of your creation and for the snow. And just for the way that it like makes things look and how we can really just kind of revel in, in just the amazing creative ways that you do things. And it hit me. It was like, yeah, I bet there's a, a lot of people out there this morning not very grateful <laughs> for all the snow. But as Al began to pray, I was just like, yeah, it is amazing. And I remember the first thing this morning, I woke up and I looked outside and I saw the snow just hanging off of the trees and hanging on the leaves. And I was just like, that is amazing. Like, how does God paint portraits that are so much better than anything we could ever imagine? And honestly, like the best art, at least to me, I'm not a modern art guy, but the best art to me is when people attempt to recreate what God already did. And they do it really, really well. It's just like, that's beautiful. That's amazing. And so, this idea of the failure to be grateful to God, I believe is one of our fundamental problems. We somehow intuitively believe that God owes us everything that we receive and probably a little more. But if we're truly grateful, we will show it in worship and in service to God. Because our response to God's goodness really does matter. Our response to God's goodness really matters. Now, Jesus, the Samaritan leper, returns to him. And what we see is the Samaritan leper throws himself down on the ground in front of Jesus. 
and begins to worship and begins to praise him and begins to thank him for what he did. And you see there, you wonder again if there's a conversation where Jesus is like, well, wait a second, where? Like, I'm, I'm pretty good at math. Like, I invented it. Like, where are the other nine? Weren't, weren't there ten of you? What happened to the other nine? And why is it that you were the only one to come back and say thank you? And the thing that really strikes me about this, this passage of Scripture is that it really does seem as if Jesus is perplexed. That he really is wondering, like, what happened to the other nine? I know there were ten of you that received this gift of healing. And it makes you wonder, were they so quick to move on with life that they simply didn't have time to thank him? And I wonder how often God is perplexed at us when we take his gifts for granted. And we move on with our lives thinking that we actually accomplished something that was simply just a gift from him. Now Jesus speaking to the man that came back, to the leper that came back, the man is still on the ground and Jesus talks to him and he says, Rise and go. Rise and go for your faith has made you well. And this phrase here, made you well, is actually translated from the Greek word sozo. And I know we've talked about this word many times, that this word sozo really means to be made whole, to be healed, and to be delivered. Now, the Greek word that was used for the other nine lepers, well, all ten of them at the time, was the Greek word that, that really deals with simply healing, with a physical healing. But then when this leper came back and showed gratitude and gave thanks to him, Jesus' word that he uses is not simply that word for healing, but an entirely new word, this sozo, that means to be made whole, to be healed, and to be delivered. You see, there was something in that act of gratitude that brought him to a new place of deliverance and being made whole. Now, researchers have proven that practicing gratitude will actually change your brain. Change the way that your brain is wired when you practice gratitude. And if repentance is what the Bible says it is, a renewing of the mind, should it be any surprise to us that this act of gratitude would be a key mechanism in how that process works? That him coming back and actually practicing that act of gratitude would begin to set him free. Begin to make him whole. Begin to see him delivered. In more ways than just having his skin flesh. Or his skin flesh. His skin made new. And his flesh made new. But Jesus was saying it's not just this. It's everything. It's all of you that is being set free and made new. And I think a story like this and the reality of that causes me to reflect and wonder sometimes if I really get it. That this really is our story. How often do we forget to say thank you? How often do we forget to really worship God for his goodness and kindness? And how do we actually go about showing our gratitude to Jesus? How do we go about showing our gratitude to the one who saved us and to set us free? And St. Augustine said this, he said, Our Lord truly has a greater desire to give than we do to receive. And he has a greater desire to show us mercy than we do to see ourselves freed from our wretchedness. And he followed that by writing, Our thoughts in this present life should turn often to the praise of God. Because it is in praising God that we shall rejoice forever in the life to come. And no one can be ready for the next life unless he trains himself in it, trains himself for it now in this life. That the act of gratitude, that the practice of gratitude isn't something just for the here and now. It's like we learned in the Victory Series. Really what we're doing on this earth now is all training and preparation for the life to come. 
And gratitude is an incredibly key piece of that. So as we close this morning, I just want to give us a few simple ways that we can train ourselves in gratitude. And the first is this. I think it's important to keep a gratitude journal. Or in the journal that you have, go ahead and begin adding in pieces of gratitude and thankfulness for what God has done. There's a man named Matthew Henry, who's a Bible commentator, who was once robbed of his wallet. And uh, in, in his diary that night, this is what he wrote. <laughs> he wrote that he was thankful first that he had never been robbed before. <laughs> Seems fair, right? Second, that though they took his wallet, they did not take his life. Third, because even though they took it all, it wasn't very much. <laughs> and then finally... And this is amazing. Finally, because he was the one who was robbed and not the one who did the robbing. Wow. So the simple act of even in difficult circumstances finding something to be grateful about and to begin to journal those and begin to thank God for those things. You know, secondly, I believe it's important to de develop a daily rhythm of thanking God for his love every morning and his faithfulness every evening. Now, our early church fathers had a rhythm in this, that they actually practiced these rhythms of life where they would do this. And even the psalmist wrote, It is good to praise the Lord and to make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. So I think even the small step of waking up and saying, God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to go about doing whatever it is that you're asking me to do today. And then to finish the day by thanking him for the opportunities that he gave you. You know, the third thing I think that we can do is to share our testimony with someone. Share our testimony with somebody. What is your testimony other than a story of gratitude for what Jesus has done in your life? Yeah. It's really what it is. I have this amazing friend uh, named Buzz. And, well, it's probably not what his mom named him, but that's what everybody calls him. But Buzz is, it's crazy. I can call Buzz, and we talk like maybe twice a year. I can call Buzz, and within two minutes of the phone call beginning, he will say something to the effect of, Ryan, this is crazy. Let me tell you what Jesus did. And I'll be like, all right, shoot. And I know it's coming. It's going to be like 15, 20 minutes, something like that, because buzz is buzz. That's what buzz does. <laughs> but every time, it, I, it, there, I mean, within two minutes, and no less, and this is, I've known this guy for 25 years now, it's always, you are not going to believe what Jesus did. And it is so inspiring because I think of how many times I have conversations where I may have a thought about, oh, well, God could do this, or God did do this, or God. But this guy just li lives with Jesus in your face. And how many of us know somebody like that where, you know, there are times where we're like, bro, he's up. But within five minutes of leaving him, you're like, I need to lean in. I need to lean in. I need more Jesus in my life. I need to experience whatever it is on a daily basis that he is experiencing. That's what I want. Because it's amazing. So share your testimony with someone. Because it is gratitude for what God has done in your life. And then the final thing, and this one may seem a little odd, but it's forgive those who have hurt you. Forgive the people who have hurt you. What does forgiveness have to do with gratitude? Everything. Because really it's a remembrance and a thankfulness to God for what God forgave us for. And that as we ponder and reflect on all the things that God has forgiven us for, even for our ingratitude to him, that then we can turn and say, you know what, God, thank you. Thank you so much for what you have done in my life. 
And not only have you forgiven me, but who am I to hold somebody else in bondage when you have given me so much? And so my hope and my prayer for us as we move into the rest of this holiday season, as we celebrate Jesus, is that we're really, really free to celebrate Jesus. Is that we wake up every morning with gratitude in our heart. That we lay our heads down on our pillow with thankfulness in our heart to what God has done for us. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us. So Jesus, we... We do, we just, we come to you with just open arms this morning and an open heart to say thank you. Thank you for how much you have given us. Thank you, God, for all the ways in which you have set us free, that you have forgiven us for things. God, even, even the memory of maybe of whatever was brought up earlier, of like, oh man, that was that thing. Father, I thank you that your forgiveness sets us free completely. And Father, I pray for a new sense of gratitude for each and every single one of us. That, that as we set our mind on you, that we do so just in a, in a reverence and an awe and a humility. That leads us to a place of, of just being on our knees and saying, God, you are so incredibly good. That when we look at the snow, when we look at just nature in general, God, it leads us to a place of saying, you are so incredibly good. So, Father, may you restore our hearts. May you make every single step that we take one of gratitude, one of thankfulness, one of healing, and one of wholeness. And we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen.